Welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nabe, always airing first on WPVMLP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online WPVMFM.org. The voice of Asheville heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI Cultural Energy Radio out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song, WalterParks.com. For more on Walter's music, Davin Dial, thank you for managing WPVM-FM in Asheville. And Robin Collier, thank you for managing KCEI in Taos, New Mexico. I do appreciate it. If you'd like to reach me, Nave at jamesnave.com. That's a great way to do it, and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I'd like to also remind you that we're sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Writing Project. If you'd like to improve your writing, imaginativestorm.com is a is a good place to go, and we'd love to have you join our community if that's something you're so in the mood to do. So today I have a, a friend on. I met uh, Colleen Queenie of, about a year ago at a little coffee shop in downtown Asheville, and a couple of days ago she sent me an email, and I happened to be in Asheville, and she wanted to meet for a coffee, and we met at the Dripolator in Black Mountain, North Carolina yesterday afternoon, and Colleen was so full of bubbly energy about the work she's doing and all the things she has her fingers in, and she and her husband are just going great guns, and I thought, my gosh, how about a twice five miles radio interview to tell us what you're doing? So, Colleen, I can't wait to get into this. Welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio. Thank you so much for having me here, James. I appreciate it. Well, I'm glad you uh, agreed, and and we had a great conversation yesterday. So, what I would like to do now is just dive in and ask you to start by telling me what you're up to with this new business that you started. And I will let you just introduce it and go for it. Right now, it's a mystery. Nobody knows what it is, but in a moment, that will all change. So tell us about it and tell us about you and your husband and what you're up to. Wow, thank you. And it's funny that you introduced saying that I had a, a bubbly and enthusiastic enthusiastic conversation with you yesterday because a lot of what we do has to do with enthusiasm and bubbles. Well, my husband and I started a kimchi company in Asheville last September, but the lead up to that was uh, 35 years worth of experience in software development and project management on my side and in business finance on the side of my husband. So we took all of our experience and put it into a huge passion of mine, which is fermenting things. So we have a huge garden and we have lots of chickens and I grow and ferment things all the time. And I started making kimchi about 15 years ago. And my friends and family kept saying, when are you going to make more kimchi? When are you going to make more kimchi? Then they said, we'll pay you for the kimchi. <laughs> so we had an opportunity last year to put some of our own money into starting up uh, Queenie Foods LLC and to start out with one product, which is kimchi. We felt like the Western North Carolina community was underserved for this product and did a lot of market research on what was available in Western North Carolina and found out through a lot of trial and error and through a lot of feedback from friends and family that uh, we make some pretty darn good authentic kimchi. So it's very straightforward Korean kimchi made out of Napa cabbage and daikon radishes and carrots and chili flakes. It's not vegan or vegetarian, like a lot of American made kimchis. It's made very traditionally with fish sauce and with brine shrimps. And we hand ferment every single batch. We hand cut every single vegetable that goes into these fermentation pots. And I applaud my husband because he's never been one to really hang out in the kitchen. And he's a, he's a very, um, he's a thinker. And so going through this process, we have really become this awesome pair in the office as well as in the kitchen. So it's been pretty cool. And we're currently selling kimchi in Asheville and in Transylvania and in Weaverville. And we go to the markets. I just heard from two more markets today, the farmer's markets that are going to be opening up in April. So we're at a really exciting time in our life right now. And I'm just super lucky because my business partner is my best friend and my soulmate. And after 27 years, I can still say that. Well, you're you're very lucky with that. And you you said that you're selling it in Transylvania for the people who are listening. Transylvania is Transylvania County, which is the 
uh, county where Brevard, North Carolina is. It's not the country of Transylvania where the vampire once lived. Although <laughs> I bet the vampire, the <laughs> I bet the vampire Dracula would enjoy kimchi as much as anybody else. Go a little deeper into describing kimchi for those people who may not be familiar with what it is. You gave me some of your kimchi yesterday and I had it for dinner, pickle and, and some of the kimchi proper. And I put it in with my dinner and it was fantastic. So why is it such an intriguing food for people and what makes them drawn to it? Well, it's traditionally served with almost every single meal in Korea. It is a traditional Korean side dish or banchan, they call it. It can be made with radishes, with squash. It can be made with cucumbers. It's so broad. If you look up ki Korean kimchi and banchan, you may see 30 different types of kimchi. But the most traditional type of kimchi is a fermented vegetable kimchi with a base that is Napa cabbage. And those are the long heads of cabbage, not the squat, hard, dense cabbage that we use mostly in America. It's a long Asian cabbage. It's also made with daikon radishes, which are also Asian radishes, and they're not traditional radishes like we think about. They're huge. They can weigh two or three pounds per radish. It's made with carrots and garlic. So I'm not sure the vampires would like it because there's 24 cloves of garlic in every small batch. So that may not be uh, the case. Um, but the people in Brevard like it. <laughs> it's also made with ginger, a lot of ginger, something called uh, a garlic chive or a Korean chive. It's a, uh, it's a long, flat chive traditionally used in Asia very commonly, but not in America. So I grow those chives in my greenhouse because they're extremely expensive to buy them here. And so uh, we actually hand produce everything at the Blue Ridge Food Ventures Commercial Kitchens um, in Anka on the AB Tech Anka campus. And then they have a room set aside for us where we ferment this food. So we mix all these things together after we hand cut them. So what happens in fermentation is that bacteria reacts with sugars and it creates a gas that changes the structure of the vegetable. And in a lot of cases, when you ferment things, they produce alcohol. And I think if you if you let kimchi ferment for long enough, it would be somewhat like kombucha, where it would have a very small amount of alcohol in it. But we ferment our kimchi from anywhere from six to 11 days, depending on the, the thickness of the vegetables. So we pot up the kimchi in the fermentation pots, and these are five gallon pots. And we only put two and a half gallons of kimchi in each pot because we have to go to the kimchi every single day with wooden mallets and push the bubbles out of the kimchi. It makes so much bubbles that it fills up a five gallon pot in 24 hours. So every single day we go and we talk to the kimchi and we listen to the kimchi and we watch the bubbles and we smell it and we taste it. And when it's fully fermented, fermented to the point where we know we like it and we know that our customers and our friends and family like it, we put it in the refrigerator and that stops the fermentation. So the kimchi ferments at a very specific temperature and it gets to a very specific pH. And so we measure that as well, but it's mostly the taste. And so kimchi is traditionally served, like I said, with almost every Korean meal. My favorite way to eat it is directly out of the jar usually about 15 or 20 minutes after I eat it, I have this amazing like gut flora feeling. It's almost take, like taking an energy shot because there's so many probiotics in it that it's super good for your gut health. It's a fantastic food. It's really fun for Michael and I, my husband, to sell this because it's so good for you. And it's local and we use organic vegetables whenever we can find them. And it's handmade in tiny little batches. And so my second favorite way to eat kimchi is on top of hot rice. So you take room temperature or cold kimchi and put it on top of hot rice. It's fantastic. It's just, it, you really get the full flavor of the kimchi and it enhances the rice. One of the super cool things about making these small batches of kimchi and jarring it ourselves is that there's a byproduct that we get from the kimchi, which is, we just refer to it as kimchi juice. There's more juice produced by the release of the, the water from the vegetables and the mix with the chili flakes and all the other flavors that there's usually about a half of a gallon of kimchi juice that's left over after we pack the jars. 
And so at the farmer's markets, if you come see us at the Waverville market or the Brevard Transylvania tailgate market or at the Gladheart Farms market, um, we have kimchi juice shots in little shot glasses. (laughs) And you can take shots of kimchi juice and literally like five, 10 minutes later, you're just going to feel like a million bucks. You can also cook with kimchi juice. You can cook rice with kimchi juice. You can cook beef roasts with kimchi juice and you get this incredible umami, unctuous piece of meat at the end of it. It's just, uh, it's extremely versatile. You can also make really awesome Bloody Marys with kimchi juice. (laughs) They are a a fantastic medium for if if you're into that kind of cocktail. If you go to our website, queeniekimchi.com, you can find out a ton of different ways to use kimchi. We have it listed for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then other serving suggestions. So it's uh, it's super versatile. And the market in America was about $9 million imported um, about 15 years ago. And now it's $39 million imported from Korea into the United States. It's even more in Australia. Um, and so we figured this was a good time to try and meet that need in this market in WNC. You know a lot about kimchi, obviously. I didn't know a thing about kimchi juice. I want some of it right now. I'll come over <laughs> to your house and take a gallon. It'd be like be like moonshine in the old days. The old moonshiners <laughs> from the Appalachian Hills were making whiskey. They probably could have would have been better off to make kimchi. I know you and your husband have spent a lot of time working on your business plan. All of the stuff that has to go into making a business like this work. So people who are listening, maybe they're thinking of doing their own entrepreneurial uh, thrust into the world of commerce. Would you tell us about how you've gone about this? And I know that you and your husband both have deep backgrounds in business, long experience in development, et cetera. So give us an overview of how that works. Um, Sure. I was in Silicon Valley in a startup company. When I was hired, there were 24 people in the company. And when I left 10 years later, there were 2,600 people in the company. So I've watched a company grow from a little tiny startup to a huge, you know, Silicon Valley kind of behemoth. And after that experience, and my husband was also working in Silicon Valley as a controller for Acer Computers, um, so got to know a whole lot about finance and and business in, in that environment. And then I went on to actually work for three more startup companies and bring them from their startup phase, sometimes 10 people, sometimes 40 people, up to an exit strategy where you either go public or you get bought. So my experience was deep and long in terms of business, and my husband's was too in terms of finance. When you go into a venture like that, if you don't put a lot of thought into it, you get thwarted in a lot of ways. And I think about young people who are super enthusiastic about making something like tempeh, or they want to make pickles and sell them at the market. I was a volunteer for Elevate Asheville, which are volunteer business people with experience who are helping small business owners make the right decisions to build their businesses. So not only was I doing this in real life with my businesses, but I was helping other folks do this with volunteering at Elevate Asheville. So with all that background, Michael and I were able to go into this um, with a very clear idea of how much money it was going to cost us, where we were going to get that money, that we had to deal with the federal government because we're making and selling food, that we had to deal with the local and state governments in terms of the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. We had to follow all of the safety protocols associated with commercial kitchens and commercial Um, sanitation processes um, in terms of buying commercial jars and packaging equipment and sanitizing jars and lids and packages. And so how do you do this? You know, well, you get a little help from this commercial kitchen folks, but you also, the first thing we did was write a business plan. How are we going to fund this? How are we going to know if it's successful? Is there a market for it? So the amount of market research that went into this was pretty significant. My husband did a bunch of searching for online kimchi. What's available? How much does it cost per ounce? Do they ship it? Do you have to ship it cold? Is it pasteurized or is it traditional kimchi, which is not pasteurized? It has to be refrigerated. 
So all of this, you know, thought process, I went into all of the local Asian markets, local health food markets, local butcher shops, whoever was selling kimchi and did the exact same thing. How much are they selling? How much are they selling it for? How much does it cost per ounce? What kind of containers is it in? You know, is it vegan? Is it vegetarian? Is it traditional? So we did all of these things before we ever signed a contract with a commercial kitchen to go in and actually start cutting vegetables. Um, We had to go find a wholesaler that could provide us with organic, you know, and local vegetables. So we had literally a checklist that, that had probably about 35 things on it that involved federal, local, market research, business plan, financing, you know, where are we going to do this logistically? How are we going to store this stuff? How are we going to distribute these things? We just got our magnets for our truck that now have our Queenie Kimchi logo on them. (laughs) So when we do deliveries, they'll know it's us. Um, That was kind of exciting. Um, So again, it, it took us about six months to research this and figure out if this was viable before we decided to really kind of put the money into it and start it. And we also have a number in our minds where that we need to reach, where we can say, this company is going to make it or it's not going to make it. And we're totally prepared for either one of those scenarios, but we're very realistic about what that looks like. And so that's another thing you kind of have to go into when you're starting a new business is, is being mindful of when it's working or it's not working. And if it's working, how are you going to get more money to put into it? Or do you need to? Are you making enough to grow your business? So how do you grow your business if it's really working? And if it doesn't work, what's your alternative? So those are a lot of the things that we thought about before we even started. I want to go back a beat or two and ask you to unpack how you choose or how you chose the vegetable purveyor. What were the requirements for that? Because that's interesting. You don't just go out and find somebody that has a bunch of vegetables unless you do some research. I don't see them everywhere. There must be out there though. It's farm country here. Absolutely. And so that definitely took some research. I have a neighbor who owns a small business and distributes seeds actually all over the country for people who garden. And uh, he turned me on to a, a farmer that he knows very well. I started talking to that farmer and started talking about um, them actually growing vegetables for us on their organic farm. And that's too cost prohibitive for us at this point to actually buy plots on a farm and have them plant the things that we needed. So then I got in touch with the WNC Farmers Market, the, the main farmers market out on Brevard Road. I called the, the main switch line and I said, hey, this is what we're trying to do. We want to get local and organic whenever possible. She was like, all these four, you know, these, these, these four farms and uh, talked to all four of them, interviewed them, talked about where they got their things, how they distributed, do they deliver, and came down to working with Mountain Foods products. And they are a distributor. We actually just back our truck up directly to Mountain Foods at the WNC Farmers Market. That's where their distribution is. They load up the back of our truck with a hundred some pounds of cabbage and 20 pounds of onions and 40 pounds of carrots and daikon. And it's uh they're they're fantastic, they're fast, they're very efficient. Um, and you know, they they have somebody that you can work with internally who deals only with local and or only with organic or both. So they were really helpful in in um, kind of walking us through that process. And, you know, the first time we went to go pick up food, it was kind of funny. We had no idea what we were doing or where we were going. And um, as soon as we found them, they're like, oh, you're here. We got all your stuff. Here you go. It was really a, a delightful experience, but it did take some research. You and Michael have a great relationship, you told me. 27 years in and still discovering more and more things to do. And we never get tired of each other. You told me a little bit, and this is changing the subject slightly from Kim Chi. You told me about how the two of you met and what you were up to when you met. And I'm curious if you would be willing to share that, that story of romance with, with us again. Yeah. Um, So I moved to Silicon Valley uh, and he had been living there with his brother 
in this small apartment complex um, on the top floor. The elevator was broken. The movers who were moving my things had to carry them up five flights of stairs, and it was about 98 degrees outside. They were moving my things in, and Michael and his brother came across the hall with a pitcher of lemonade and some red solo cups. And they had deep Southern accents. <laughs> and I had lived in Michigan my whole life, so I was not exposed to a lot of Southern. And they walked in, uh, both very handsome. And uh, I, I, I don't, I, there is love at first sight. I, I absolutely fell in love with them like that day. We ended up getting to know each other pretty well. Unfortunately, I was actually engaged at the time to somebody in Michigan. And so uh, I ended that quite quickly after I met Michael. And I had been dating the other gentleman for many years, actually. And so when I met Michael, I fell in love with him immediately. And we were married within seven months of knowing each other. And uh, that was 27 years ago. So <laughs> worked out pretty well. And uh, he was in um, business finance and he was the controller for Acer Computers. And um, I was so smitten with him that I couldn't remember his name. And he lived right across the hall from me, but I knew that he worked at Acer Computers. So I just started calling him Ace. And to this day, that is what I call him. <laughs> we hear a lot of stories about love at first sight. And some people actually say, like you did, I had that experience. What do you think that is? Why do you think that happens? Is it love? Is it something else? Does it grow into love? And how has your love evolved and changed over the years? And is there anything left now that feels like it did the first time you met? Or how has that evolved into what it is now, which seems, as you say, quite good? Yeah, um, I can't say that it's love at first sight. I think there's a chemical reaction that happens. It's like pheromones or something. Like you feel something that you've never felt before with anybody else. And so you feel compelled to want to know this person, to spend time with this person. And that that chemical reaction is there and it just bleeds into this ability to talk to each other and get to know one another and fall in love very quickly, which is what we did. We have spent uh, a lot of times through our life really working on our communication. You know, how do we talk to each other? How do we tell each other things? And it's, it's a process. You just never stop doing that. You never stop doing that. And if you stop doing that, then you stop finding out new things about each other. We have this way of looking at each other. There's so much ridiculous amount of laughing in this house. My mother just recently moved in with us. She lives in the apartment downstairs. And she's like, I cannot believe how much you guys laugh. There's so much laughter in this house. I think that's a huge part of having such a tight relationship is we really allow each other to laugh with and at each other. Um, but we also are very clear when we need to work on our communication and we change it if we need to do that. And so it's just built this bond, I think, that allows us to be work partners, live in the same house, you know, with my mom, who we both get along great with, and raised chickens, raised two beautiful children who are out in the world and are happy and healthy and funny. <laughs> But, you know, we never stopped working on it, even though it started out with that amazing chemistry and we fell in love very, very quickly. And I feel like we still have, like, this is a, just our next adventure. When you say you had to work on the communication, was that something that you evolved and you worked on it in the sense of letting it evolve and expand? Or did you come up with specific things that you needed to change? And could you give us an example of that? Yeah, there definitely was an evolution. Um, and when we first moved here from Silicon Valley, our children were very small. And we kind of just ran into a wall with an inability to explain to each other how the other one was making them feel. And when we broke through that barrier and said, I just need to tell you how I feel. 
and this is how I feel and this is how you feel. It, it was a, a huge breakthrough for us. And it was a, a like a kind of a leapfrog in our relationship. And that just continued to grow. So once we broke through that barrier, of truly being able to tell each other how we made each other feel and accepting that and saying, okay, if you like that, then let's keep doing that. If you don't like that, how can we change that? So that was, a, I think, a, a really big part of the evolution. But, you know, before that, we were kind of young and just working like crazy. We were on a NASCAR team together. We were raising little babies, working 60 hours a week in Silicon Valley and playing hard on the weekends and um, a lot of fun. When we moved to Asheville, we had no family, no friends. Neither of us had a job. We moved here just to get out of Silicon Valley and raise our kids in a beautiful place. And so we were in this home together and without friends, it was a, it was really a forced situation where we had to, we were together all the time and we had to figure out how we were going to communicate with each other for the rest of our lives. And that was the start of it. Well, you just dropped NASCAR into the mix and I'm sure somebody listening out there perked up when they heard you were on a NASCAR team with your husband. Please tell us more about NASCAR racing, which is something that people might not expect from kimchi to NASCAR or from NASCAR yeah. to kimchi. It's all yeah. it's all bubbly, though. Your relationship is bubbly with your husband. <laughs> NASCAR yeah. is bubbly when the racing and the kimchi is bubbly. So you're fermenting all kinds yeah. of stories. When you're a computer engineer, it doesn't mean you're not another kind of engineer. So some of the engineers that I worked with were super into building cars. And so when we were living in, in uh, Silicon Valley, the Winston West series, which is a NASCAR series on the West Coast, ran a series of races that were uh, dirt track and asphalt track, and they were called street stock, late model modifieds, and sprint cars. And it's a feeder network up to the larger NASCAR, uh, the main NASCAR events. We weren't racing at Talladega. <laughs> but one of our good friends, still a great friend, uh, um, now lives in Mooresville in the center of NASCAR. But he was a car expert and he said, I want to start a team. And we said, OK, you know, we're working 60, 70 hours a week, but we'll put in the time on the weekends and drive all over California and Arizona and <laughs> work on these cars. And so I learned how to use a, a, a torch welder and strip skins off of Camaros and junkyards and weld them back onto cars and change tires on a dirt track in the middle of a race. And so my husband and I were both over the wall um, at these races. And it was kind of a really great release for people who what you do every day is work with computers and computer networks and code and to get your hands dirty and have the smell of a, a racetrack and the burning fuel and a hot engine and, you know, mud and tires. It was very tactile and satisfying outside of this whole world of Silicon Valley and literally sitting in conference room one day with Steve Jobs and then taking tires off of a, a dirt track car that following Saturday. So it was just a, a great way to balance. We did that for four years. And then I got pregnant and you found out that I couldn't have a NASCAR license and be pregnant and be in the, the pits. So that was the end of that. <laughs> Well, you had another kind of uh, race to run when you got pregnant. When you were telling me about NASCAR, I knew a bit about how much money was involved in it and how much money they make. So could you talk a bit about the business of NASCAR and how that works? I mean, I know you said a, a price for us, us tickets, 160 to $200, and then the infield is more. and uh, it's a huge enterprise. So talk about that level of business and how the NASCAR business works. Even in the lower tiers of NASCAR, um, cars have sponsors um, because you can't just start a team. Well, unless you're a millionaire, but you need money to have a race car because race cars need motors and skins and roll cages and fuel and tires and um, need a big trailer and need a whole bunch of tools and you got to have smart people that can work on this car. And then when you go to a race and you get in a wreck, if you don't have a backup car, you got to fix that one. 
So sponsors are a huge part of NASCAR. And the lower ranks of NASCAR that we raced in had much smaller venues. So there were less people paying to see them. And so the need for sponsors and for basically paying for it ourselves just becomes really cost prohibitive. So unless you've got a really good sponsor for some of those small teams, you just never make it out of it. It becomes a a play sport like it was for us. We never got up into the big ranks of anything because we were all, you know, working 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, and just playing on the weekend. It was just, it was fun, but it became too expensive. We didn't have the sponsorship that we needed to keep going without us putting all our money into it. Had other things to do once we started having kids. (laughs) And so up in the higher ranks of NASCAR, so much of that is covered by those sponsors that are covered with huge decals for their sponsors. You have your Tide car and your STP car, and those sponsors put in millions and millions of dollars to those teams every year to keep those, those trucks running. So a lot of those race car drivers have families and They literally have schools that travel around in the form of huge semis that are mobile schools for those race, those racers, children that go to those tracks during that whole season. It's pretty amazing, but it's very expensive. (laughs) Well, I never imagined that you would have mobile schools to follow the children around. The reason I'm interested in this, I grew up in Asheville. And when I was growing up, we had the Asheville Motor Speedway, or it was the Amboy Raceway, actually. And then it changed to the Asheville Motor Speedway. It was on Amboy Road. Now they have a park there. And when I was growing up, it was a dirt track. And then they eventually paved it. Banjo Matthews, Robert Presley, a few other notables that I don't remember now, were, were racing at that track. And I would go down and watch the races. And it was about as cinematic as it could possibly be. And one of the things that everybody in Asheville knew, they knew when Friday night was around because you could hear the straight pipes from those racing cars all over Asheville and eventually noise pollution. And there was a lot of it uh, overtook the population. And they finally, finally closed Amboy Raceway down much to the chagrin of many people who remember it. And I do remember going to the track and, and often people would crash. There were big crashes and lots of dr- drama when the, they crashed. I don't ever recall anybody being badly hurt, but I do remember hoping to see a crash. I hate to be so macabre, but I did. And of course, I was a kid and I wanted the excitement. And they rode around on the banked curves and those cars were would go so, so fast. And it seemed like the people who were driving were working during the week. They come down and drive on Friday night. So when you were working, did you see a lot of crashes? How did the people keep safe? Was it as dangerous as it probably was at Amboy Raceway when I was growing up? Well, the things that you describe um, are exactly my experiences at Watsonville Motor Speedway, which was our home track in Watsonville, south of San Jose in California. And the saying in NASCAR and in racing in general is, that's racing. And what that means is, yeah, you're going to get in a wreck. You may get hurt. That's racing. Part of the excitement of watching cars speed around a track within inches of each other is to see them wreck, you know, and see them not wreck, see them get out of a wreck, see them avoid a wreck. The knowledge that these car chiefs have to have to set these cars up to avoid wrecks in so many different ways by their chassis setups and their spoilers. And it's um it's a fascinating art and engineering feat to be able to drive so close to another car without crashing into it. And especially when you get them on these dirt tracks. Um, so in the case of, of dirt track racing, the cars are uh, very hardy. Their roll cages are pretty spectacular. Their skins are pretty thin, so they rip off, and you can just replace them. Uh, so that's not that expensive. But when you get a rollover, you know, there's lots of lots of safety equipment. There was even back when I was racing in the late '90s and early 2000s. But the safety equipment that's available now is is unbelievable. Since the death of Dale Earnhardt Sr., the safety in racing has uh, improved pretty much exponentially in the years since that accident. How do people move up to the bigger NASCAR circuit? You said this was a feeder mm-hmm. proposition. So what do you have to do to qualify to get into the NASCAR 
racing and what kind of skill do you have to have? And is it a certain type of personality? Did you notice the personalities when you were working? How did, how did that work? Um, I think there's three things that have to do with it. Personality isn't really that much one. It's who you know, how much money you have, and how much you win. It's still kind of a good old boy network. So if you know the right people and you're winning races, they can get you money and you can move up the ranks in NASCAR. So even if you're kind of not a nice person, you can still make it in NASCAR because you know the right people, you have money, and you win. Well, I've gotten quite infatuated with the F1 racing because of the Netflix show. Do you know the yes. different do you know the difference between say F1 drivers and NASCAR drivers? Could an F1 driver be a NASCAR driver and could a NASCAR driver be an F1 driver or is it just completely different? Um there are definitely open wheel drivers who also drive NASCAR stock cars. Uh Tony Stewart was doing that back in the day. He would go between uh, open wheel racing and NASCAR racing. So it's absolutely possible. I think they have a lot of the same gusto and gumption and knowledge. The cars definitely behave differently. And you can't bump and run in an open wheel car like you can in a, 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 a stock car. They're just not made for that. Uh, so there's a different mentality around it. But I think they have a lot of the same traits. And is the speed the same for the NASCAR upper level? And I know F. F1 cars race at 200 miles an hour. Is that the same true for NASCAR? Um, on the super speedways, uh, NASCAR cars can get up to close to 200 miles an hour, but they also run on small tracks or short tracks, which are uh, a lot slower. You, you may be at, you know, uh, 75 miles an hour in a curve, and 160 in the straightaway on a shorter track. So it, it really uh, depends on the track when you're racing, racing NASCAR. NASCAR also does do some road courses, which show you, it slow you down a lot. It's not an oval, but the, the F1 cars are faster. What about all the environmental considerations? People are listening to this thinking, my gosh, this is an environmental disaster. Do you have any thoughts on that? I spent enough time breathing the fumes at a, at a racetrack that, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> it's very costly for the environment. And I think, you know, when you listen to some road racers are just fuming, pun intended, about the fact that somebody can pull up in a new Tesla at a road race and beat every, you know, combustion engine on the track without even being modified. So, hey, let's start making electric race cars. <laughs> so the driving is still the same, no matter whether it's an electric car or a gasoline powered car would that be right the competition would be the same or would it change if the electric cars are faster that might make it more interesting yeah it, it would be different they act different um the the ballast in a race car is in the front in the engine a ballast in an electric car the whole underside belly of the car is lined with these huge batteries so it's it's going to act differently. I think you would learn how to drive an electric race car versus a combustion engine race car. I think it would be a learned skill and it would be different. I think the racing would be different. So I want to move now to another kind of oval, another kind of circle. There's a path in Asheville around a lake called Beaver Lake, and you live nearby Beaver Lake. And I would like for you to tell me and tell those people listening outside of Asheville what your relationship is with that lake. I've walked around Beaver Lake myself. It's at the end of Merriman Avenue going north out of Asheville. It could not be more delightful. And they do have beavers and birds and fish and everything you can imagine in as, as far as wildlife is concerned. So tell us about Beaver Lake. You and your husband walk at 8 o'clock every morning around the lake. What's going on with that? And describe it for people that are not in Asheville. So we moved here in uh, 2002 and my son was seven months old and my daughter was not quite two. And this neighborhood is kind of like a fairy tale. There's a, a beautiful waterfall that comes off of the dam that releases the water from Beaver Lake. And that waterfall, you can hear the waterfall from our house. And so my children grew up with that waterfall as part of their backdrop. The dam is just alive with turtles and herons and egrets. 
And just the view as we leave our home on All Clare Drive and walk up Glen Falls and cross over the bridge that allows you to look out across Beaver Lake as you look south. It sparkles in different ways every morning. The clouds on the mountains are different every morning. I mean, it, I can't even tell you how many times I want to take a picture when we're walking. It's like, okay, how many pictures could I possibly have of Beaver Lake? And that walk every day is just a little bit different. And sometimes it's wet and cold, and sometimes it's bright and beautiful, and sometimes it's hot and muggy. But the path is super well cared for. You get to walk right through the bird sanctuary. You get to right, walk right past, literally, where there's a beaver dam that you can see from a little bridge that goes over a creek on Merriman Avenue as you follow the path towards the bird sanctuary. Then you get to walk through the woods, thick woods, where every once in a while we'll run into a gigantic black bear. Um, and, and he lives up there somewhere. Uh, sometimes he'll be lumbering across the path. It's a little unnerving, but we're kind of ready for it now. <laughs> and the strangely enough, we've watched uh, beaver beaver dams come and go. We've never seen a beaver. <laughs> never seen one there. <laughs> we keep looking though. But uh, yeah, lots of lots of beautiful bird watching. My son is an avid bird watcher and spent a lot of time with my mom uh, bird watching at Beaver Lake and, and learning about the wildlife there. But We've lost many kites and trees at Beaver Lake and um, played a lot of soccer with all the other kids in the neighborhood and the fields um, on both sides, both ends of the lake. It's a great place to have a picnic in the springtime. Um, had some Mother's Days there on a blanket with some great snacks. So it's been um, a really integral part of our life. And now even though my children are grown, my husband and I really have started a new relationship with Beaver Lake and it's just part of our routine now. So we spend a lot of time with her and she's been good to us and, and to our family. So there's a little rock garden now in the woods. People leave uh, rocks or little uh, gemstones or little painted rocks or it's great. And it's a, it's a very giving community. So as you come and go, people take things that they need and leave things that they think other people might need. It's just a, a little, nice little heartbeat in the middle of the Beaver Lake community. People listening to this outside of Asheville might be imagining a remote lake somewhere way out in the country. Beaver Lake is really in North Asheville proper. And the path that you are describing, when you get through the woods, you pass by houses that are beautiful luxury homes that overlook the lake some of them probably worth two million dollars sitting yeah. above overlooking the lake and when you circle back around merriman avenue is one of the main arteries and the houses along merriman avenue are also equally as luxurious so this is not only a luxurious place for the for the great blue heron standing there in the in the, in the lake but also for the people who live around it so it's 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 an exclusive neighborhood that is open to everybody who wants to come and walk around the lake. So exclusive, yes. Uh, open to the whole whole uh, town, absolutely. Yeah, it's a gem. It truly is, and it it, it it's in the the center of North Asheville. It's like a, it's kind of a center point in North Asheville. But yeah, it's surrounded completely by at the south end um, a commercial. Uh, part of uh, Beaver Lake, the or the uh, North Asheville area, the North Asheville Public Library is the cornerstone at the south end of the lake. Um, that leads into two or three sets of strip malls with the grocery stores and restaurants. So the north end of the lake is all residential. It's all, all surrounded by residential areas. But it, the tranquility on that path is is notable for being in a central part of a busy city. Yeah, the contrast is just absolutely amazing. I love Beaver Lake. That's why I'm asking about it. And I go there all the time when I'm in Asheville, as I am right now. So as we come close to our time to close, uh, what do you have in mind for Kim Chi as you move forward in this bubbly life, this fermentation of of joy that you have? And I love it. I'm so grateful to 
have experienced our time yesterday and to hear these stories today about what you're up to. So what does the future hold for you and, and your, your project? Well, we are going to continue to distribute. We It's available uh, at a few retail outlets right now, and we hope to make it available at more retail outlets. Um, can I mention those? Yeah. Uh, you can buy Queenie Kimchi at the Chop Shop at 100 Charlotte Street in Asheville. You can also get it at uh, the Blue Ridge Market, which is uh, just north of Beaver Lake on Merriman. On the right-hand side, it's a great little farm market. Um, and uh, we are just getting acceptance letters from all the other uh, Asheville and West, Western North Carolina um, farmers markets. We're currently available at the Glad Hearts Farm Market on Sunday, the Transylvania Farm Market in Brevard on Saturdays, and Wednesday at the um, Weaverville Tailgate Market, which is at the community center at Lake Boer. Um, I am continuing to talk to other retail outlets and um, you can buy the kimchi online. We do ship anywhere in the lower 48 states. So um, I want, we're going to start participating in festivals. We're going to try and get into the Fermenti festivals this year, as as well as other um, festivals to to get our name out there. And hopefully, we've gotten so many positive responses from people. Um, I've had people tell me multiple times, "This is the best kimchi I've ever had." It just makes my heart want to explode. Um, and so the response we've gotten is really positive. So if it goes really well, we probably will start looking for our, our own facility as opposed to using a, um, a public commercial kitchen. Um, if it, if it goes really well, that's the next thing we're going to be thinking about. Well, Colleen, thank you so much for taking this time to be with us and to tell us about everything you're doing. I really appreciate it. So I, if you if you don't have anything else to say, we can I can just say thank you very much. Thank you, Navi. I appreciate your time and I appreciate your friendship. Yeah, well, me too. Back back to you, and I look forward to more kimchi. All right, I'll, I'll make sure it's available. And there you go, my friends. Thus concludes my conversation with Colleen Queenie. Now we know a little bit more about kimchi have some insight into NASCAR racing and the beavers that dwell in Beaver Lake just north of downtown Asheville off of Merriman Avenue in one of the most beautiful settings you'll ever find. So if you're living in Asheville and you are in the mood to go to Beaver Lake, just drive out Merriman Avenue from I-240. It's about 10, 15 minutes north. And when you get there, you'll know it because it's a big lake and you will see it on your left. And now to take us up to the top of the hour, I would like to offer you the sound version of a video I recorded yesterday sitting on the porch of Mountain Stream at Lake Eden Retreat. It's about how to not be afraid to speak in public. And it's inspired by a book that my creative collaborator, Allegra Houston, and I wrote titled How to Read for an Audience. So here's what I said. A few years ago, my good friend, poet and writer, Nicole Brown and I were having a conversation about the the ways one goes about presenting work in public, reading your work in public, performing your work in public. And Nicole knew I'd been involved in the performance poetry world for years and years, and she had a pretty good sense that I knew some things about it and had done it a lot. And I'd learned from all the mistakes I made. And she said, well, why don't you write a small little book, a handbook for poets, writers, people who need to read their work in front of an audience, need to perform their work in front of an audience. She said, there's nothing like that out there. So there's a big need for it. And I resisted it a little bit. I said, well, you know, what do I have to say? I, I, could, I could tell you a few things about it. I can help you if you like. And she said, no, 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 you need to, you need to write this book. And, you know, I said, okay, okay, um, I'll I'll do that. So I presented the idea to my creative collaborator, Allegra Houston. And Allegra said, well, I think it's a great idea. If you write the book, I'll I'll help you edit it. And so I did. I thought, I'll I'll just get down to business and try to write a very practical book about how you can can engage your audience in ways that, that, that are easy, simple, and to the point. And so I sat down and started to to work on the book. And one of the 
one of the um, sparks that got our conversation going, Nicole and I were talking about this idea because we had both been at Vermont College getting our MFA degrees at the same time in the early 2000s. And Vermont always had lots and lots of readings in the evening. So the poets and the writers would come and they would study and work and go through the workshops. And, and then in the evenings they would sign up for the open mic or the open reading and stand up and they would have five, seven minutes to present whatever work they had. And I got into a lot of conversations with poets and writers about reading versus, versus performing. And a lot of the poets, writers there, were very good on the stage. They were engaging. Didn't matter whether they had their work memorized or whether it was, was written. You know, they would engage emotionally with the work and look up at the audience and engage with the audience. And it was quite, quite, um, quite meaningful, entertaining, enjoyable. And then there were others. And I had more than one conversation with these others. And the others had this attitude which was a bit, I found, quite elitist. They would say, I don't perform my work. I only read. Or they would say, I, don't, I, I only read my work. I never perform it. And I would always say, well, how could that be? Well, I read. I don't do anything but read. I just give the words, and the words stand alone. And they, were, they always were very sure of themselves. And I'm thinking, well, these are the people that, that bore me to death. These are the people that put me to sleep. And so I, I, I thought later of a joke, and I'd like to show you the joke now. So if, and, and I wanted to say this to them, and I, I didn't really say it because it's a bit too snarky. But I did come up with an idea for them. So I wanted to give it to you now. Here's how you can do a perfect reading for any audience, no matter what size it is, from two people to a thousand people. So I'm going to give you a little workshop, it only takes 30 seconds or so. This is how you, you read for an audience and you do it perfectly. And I did write the book, here it is, how to read for an audience, um, collaborating with Allegra Houston. So here's how you read for an audience and here's how you do it perfectly. So are you, are you ready? Here we go. Since this is a video, you're not able to see me sitting there quietly reading, flipping the page, but that's what I'm doing and that's the joke. And I pick it up afterwards. Thank you, thank you very much. So that is how you read for an audience. You sit down and you read. Anything else you do really falls in the category of performance. And what people mean by reading is really not read quietly and let the people look at you. It really means that you're actually speaking. And to say you're reading doesn't get you off the hook regarding your performance, regarding your responsibility for your audience. It does say and suggest that when you read aloud, you have a responsibility to connect. Here, this is a, a reading aloud, pretty, pretty standard. This is what most people mean. Keep in mind that what you remember is never totally accurate and never complete. Once you accept that you'll never remember perfectly, it becomes easier to be creative with your memories. Let's say you were sitting in a cafe listening to the radio. The station might have been WMS or it might not. Maybe it was June and the night frogs were loud in the trees. Or maybe there was a bitterly cold draft coming through the ill-fitting windows. Either way, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you have an abundance of concrete sensory details in your mind. Now this is the section where we talk about remembering and trying to get a sense of sense of the peace in your mind so when you read it you have something going on in your imagination that you can connect emotionally to to the work so that would be an example of reading your work or an example of more performance memorized would be something like two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry i could not travel both and be one traveler along i stood and i looked down one as far as i could to where it bent in the undergrowth and then I, I took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. Now that was an example of storytelling a poem. I'm not gonna demonstrate the slam poetry 
category right now. Slam poetry is very high energy. So you can go any way you want. The idea here is to honor your voice, to allow yourself to embrace who you are, trust what you have to say. Most of what we have to say comes from simplicity, not complexity. It's not complex. Is complexity a word? I don't know. <laughs> it is now. So trust yourself when you allow your voice to come out into the world, it becomes almost a third participant or the fourth participant. It's, a, it's, it's you expanded. It's you extended. It's you inviting us in to hear what you have to say. So how to read for an audience. Um, stuff nobody teaches you. So maybe you've learned a little bit here. So thanks for listening. I appreciate it. And what you just heard, I recorded as a video on the porch of Mountain Stream at Lake Eden Retreat, where I'm staying right now, about 20 minutes east of Asheville. So many people are afraid to speak in public, so I hope this little commentary that I offered at the end of the show helps you to have a better sense of how not to be afraid to speak in public. And on that note, I'll say thank you for listening to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to. And remembering, I'm your host, James Nave, always airing first on WPVMLP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online, WPVMFM.org. The voice of Asheville heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio, out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song, WalterParks.com. For more on Walter's music, Nave at JamesNave.com is how you can reach me. I would love to hear from you. We're sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Writing Project. If you would like to learn more about how to improve your writing chops, ImaginativeStorm.com is a good place to go. And if you'd like to delve deeper into your writing, I'm hosting the Lake Eden Writing Week. It's a writer's vacation, May 19th through 25th at Lake Eden Retreats, where I am now. Should be a good gathering of writers featuring Nicole Brown, Alan Wolf, Sebastian Matthews. You can find out more about the Writing Week at jamesnave.com. So once again, thank you ever so much for tuning in, and I do hope you return soon. Till then, I'll catch you on that turnaround somewhere down the line.